This huge Nile crocodile died mysteriously in captivity. Now a team of experts will dissect this mighty beast and find out why. I found fishing lures, shotgun wads, house cats, you name it. Mm. This rare opportunity offers a chance to explore the animal's inner workings. Once they get a hold of a prey item, we'll go into death rolls, they'll spin. The team will uncover the astonishing anatomy that gives crocodiles the strongest bite on the planet. Cool. Well, that's great. If this were easy to cut through, it wouldn't be very good armor, would it? They'll investigate its vital organs as they piece together the cause of death. It's a lot more tubes than you see in a human heart. And they'll uncover the evolutionary secrets that have enabled this ancient animal to survive virtually unchanged since the time of the dinosaurs. Oh, great fight. <laughs> Join us as we go deep inside the crocodile. This 280 kilo crocodile died unexpectedly at a breeding center in France. Samuel Martin, the center's director, has brought it here to the Royal Veterinary College in London for investigation. He hopes this team of specialists can find the cause of its mysterious death. For team leader Greg Erickson, the dissection also offers a rare opportunity to explore the anatomy of one of evolution's great survivors. What we're looking at here is a Nile crocodile. This is the dominant predator in the waterways of Africa. And one thing that you can see right here is that this animal is incredibly streamlined. It you know, tapers down to this big flat tail. This is where this animal generates uh, propulsion through water. All these bumps you see here are actually bony armor. And as you move up to the front here, this is the, you know, the head, the jaws, and the teeth. This is uh, how this animal makes a living. And what we're going to do today is we're going to dissect uh, this part of the anatomy in particular to understand how these animals generate these enormous bite forces. Wow. That's an impressive animal, huh? How are we doing down there? Yeah. Someone on this leg here. I think what we want to do is we'll go down both sides of this, start peeling back. Uh, let's go to the skin first. Skin first. Even with the sharpest surgical knives, cutting through its thick protective skin is tough work. What are you doing there? The team want to understand the specialized anatomy that makes the crocodile one of the most successful ambush predators in the wild. A huge five-meter croc can lie hidden in shallow water and then launch itself in a fraction of a second. Its bite is far stronger than a lion or a great white shark. And once locked on, it won't let go. Perhaps the most impressive demonstration of the croc's bite was caught on home video in Florida. Alligator wrestler Kenny Cypress is lucky to get out of this encounter with his head intact. It takes four people to pry these jaws apart. Cool. 
As an expert in crocodilian anatomy, Greg Erickson regularly risks life and limb collecting bite force measurements. He's got tape. I've got one. Here in Florida, he's never short of test subjects, but they're not always keen to take part. Okay. It's a big one. Okay. Very good. All right. Wow. <laughs> nice teeth. Okay, everybody set? Try to hold that head straight if you can. <laughs> ready, set? Okay, here we go. Everybody ready? Oh, wow. Great bite. That's a good one. <laughs> She's muscle. 1,683 pounds. Wow. Now, when I move this meter, it's, it's, this animal's going to reassert itself, and, and, the, and the force will be about 90% of the initial force. Here we go. Watch this. Look at that. That's it right there. You know, if you could bench press like a Mini Cooper or something, then uh, you could get out of there. It's about to come out here. The dissection team is working on the massive muscles responsible for that bite. These muscles are very pale. They're, they're not oxidated muscles. There's not a lot of blood flow to them. And uh, because of the properties of these muscles, these animals can generate really uh, explosive bite forces, but they can't sustain it. Crocs use these rapid fire muscles first to grab onto their target and then in short bursts when the prey struggles or moves. So, I mean, I get a hand flipping this big boy. But on the other side of its head, the crocodile has a different set of muscles for opening its jaws. These muscles are so weak that a few loops of tape can prohibit the animal from opening its mouth. These are the muscles that this animal uses to lift its uh, skull up. That's this one here, right? Yep. Okay, good. And notice how dark it is. It's a, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it, it can hold their, its mouth open for a long time and then because it's continually getting uh, oxygen and energy. Unlike the pterygoid muscles that we just looked at, which are muscles for really, really rapid forces, but, but not sustained. The dissection team reveals the hidden secrets of the crocodile's jaw. Two rather small, weak muscles open it. But it's the huge jaw closers that make the croc's bite so strong. Anchored beneath the skull, these muscles pull the upper jaw down with tremendous force. Other big biters, such as lions and hyenas, use muscles high on their heads. But the croc's low slung jaw muscles enable it to have a stealthy low profile in the water. We're going to try to open up the jaws on this animal. Uh, one thing that happens uh, once, once an animal dies is that uh, all, the, all the muscles lock up, so to speak, and it's difficult to open up the jaws. So, but we're, we're going to give it our best shot. Go ahead and put a rope under there. Oh, yeah. There it comes. Get a good grip. One, two, three. <coughs> Hold it. <laughs> Too much more. That's about it. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's great. It's absolutely great. This provides a great demonstration of how this posterior pterygoid comes off the, the back of the skull here and comes down around the jaw and then comes up through here um, and basically pulls down uh, on this part of the skull, helping to bring these jaws together. Pretty impressive. But not all crocodiles have such big bites. 
Some have evolved different jaws to suit different environments. These are two members of the crocodile family. Uh, this is a gharial from uh, India, and this is a saltwater crocodile from Australia. One of the things we see as we look at these two skulls is that they're related animals and every bit of the skull matches. They are adapted to catch different kinds of prey. This one's adapted to catch fish. This one's adapted to catch large animals that are on land. What this one needs is rapid movement of the jaws, snapping them shut with immense speed, with very little water resistance. What this one has is the ability not to shut the jaws particularly fast, but great force for hanging on and then crushing bones once it's got it. You cannot have both. Evolution is filled with compromises. You can't have both high speed and great force. There are many other such compromises. So far, we've seen how a crocodile bites. The next stage of the kill is to pull the prey into the water and drown it. And to do that, the crocodile has had to evolve teeth tough enough to take the strain. The teeth of this animal's jaws are very simplistic. They're, they're just cones, and they're not particularly sharp. What they're designed to do is sustain stresses from any direction. So when they get a hold of a prey item and it's struggling, it's not likely to break their teeth no matter which way they bend. Also, these animals, once they get a hold of a prey item, will go into death rolls, they'll spin, and the teeth can sustain that. Crocs don't have sharp teeth to slice through meat, so they use what's known as the death roll to tear off chunks of food. One of the mysteries of the death roll is how crocs manage to keep their mouth open underwater without drowning. Comparative anatomist Joy Reidenberg knows how they do it. She's looked down the throats of hundreds of animals and is a world expert on vocal and breathing anatomy. We're looking at the tip of the snout of the crocodile and right here are the nostrils. And these have little valves so they can flop open, allow air in, and then close up like little plugs. And then you have a passageway that runs from the tip of the rostrum all the way inside the skull and then dives down into the larynx, which is below this. And if we open up the mouth, Alan, if you could just lift that up for me, we see inside the complicated arrangement of the inside of this mouth has a valve that keeps water from going into the larynx or voice box. So this ridge over here overlaps with a soft palate, and that keeps water from getting into the larynx. And when we open it up and look inside, if you can lift that a little bit higher, we can see inside there is a voice box right here. This is the larynx, and there's the opening into the larynx. And we're looking down a pipe that goes down to the trachea and all the way down to the lungs. So this is where air would pass. And when this animal elevates its larynx up like that, it seals this opening, and it's connecting the opening of the larynx into the nasal passageway, which is back here. So this animal has a built-in snorkel to allow it to breathe from the nose all the way down to the lungs and not let water that's in its mouth get into here and drown the animal. If the animal wants to grab a fish, this is also a wonderful trap for catching a fish, but if it's lying on the bottom of a riverbank with its mouth open like this, waiting for a fish to swim across, it needs to make a current to actually draw the fish into the mouth so the fish doesn't keep swimming right by. And it does that by using the tongue as a piston. So this big, broad, flat tongue just drops down like that. And now the fish is drawn in with the current, and then it can go ahead and snap those jaws shut, trapping the fish. Crocodiles have an amazing sensory repertoire. And when these animals are in the water, their whole body can be submerged, except for just the cranial table here, in other words, the top of the skull. And when they do that, they have great sense of what's around them. This is the ear flap here, so they can pick up airborne sounds. Here's the eye right here. It has a vertical uh, pupil to it. So these animals uh, have great daylight vision and night vision as well. Now, what's interesting also on the face here is that you see these little dots. Those are the dome pressure sensors. This allows it to sense motion in the water. So if there's a splashing fish, uh, it can sense it and move towards it. We've seen that the croc's head is equipped with the hardware it needs to trap and kill its prey. But first, it has to catch that prey. And to do that, it uses a huge piece of anatomy representing almost half of its body, its tail.
What I'm doing here is I'm exposing the tail muscles of this crocodile, and uh, what I want to show you here is that this is almost all muscle in the tail. There's very little bone here, and if you pull this back, that whole thickness, almost as deep as my hand can go there, is solid muscle. That's on one side, the same as on the other side. So almost all of this bulk is just muscle. Let's go ahead and flop this over. There's the propeller. These fins right here are made out of keratin. They're really stiff, just like what your fingernails are made out of. What these animals do is they thrust their tail back and forth like this, and, that, and because it has an S-shaped motion to it, it causes uh, thrust to be generated backwards and allows these animals to move forward. They can swim like 20 miles an hour. It's, it's really amazing. Crocodiles have evolved as masters of the water. But as biomechanics expert John Hutchinson knows, crocs can also get around on land in more ways than you might think. We've got a nice big left front leg and hind leg of our crocodile. When the animal's going fairly slowly on muddy ground or down a slope, it will use kind of a primitive gait called the belly slide, where they just basically push themselves along with their belly on the ground. Very primitive kind of motion. But uh, when the crocodile wants to go a bit more quickly on land, it can lift itself up, kind of doing push-ups, and do what's called a high walk. You can see the foot is pointing forwards rather than out to the side, so its ankle is able to rotate. And also the uh, knee is wonderfully flexible. It can flex and extend. It can rotate from left to right. You try that with your knee, you'll be ripping ligaments, muscles, everything. It'd be very painful. But then, you might not know that they actually have a different kind of gait, even faster, when they want to really want to move quickly. And that's called the bound. We have a clip of that from my research here coming up. You can see uh, the crocodile there. And look at that. It's, it's using its forelimbs together to push itself forward and its hind limbs, left and right, synchronized to do this kind of bounding gait and holding the tail quite clear of the ground. When would they use that gait? Juvenile crocodiles need that kind of gait to escape predators or maybe even catch prey occasionally or just get to the water when they're frightened. But they do get tired really quickly and then they're just done. Once they're tired out, they're done sometimes for a day or two, just so fatigued from using this kind of motion. And this crocodile here probably couldn't have bounded. Its legs are just relatively too small and weak compared with its, with its body. So this is a survival gait? Mm, it, it, it definitely is and it probably always has been. It's thought this running ability may date back to the time of the dinosaurs, when small crocodile ancestors ran down their prey. 200 million years ago, ancient crocodile relatives lived on land. Like Terrestris sucus, a long-legged reptile not much bigger than a rabbit. Later, some crocs took to the water, their eyes and nostrils move to the top of their heads, allowing them to keep a low profile. And supported by water, their bodies dramatically increased in size. 110 million years ago, enormous megacrocs like Sarcosuchus grew over 10 meters long. These supercrocs died out, but their smaller cousins flourished and started to resemble more modern crocodiles. Remarkably, over the last 100 million years, they've hardly changed at all. Can we go ahead and give us a midline? So why has this prehistoric internal anatomy worked so well for so long? Perhaps the team can find a clue in the croc's stomach. They'd like to find out how it's able to digest the huge chunks of meat it swallows before they start rotting inside. I don't know when this animal last fed. About a week before it died, so. Okay. Might be fish or poultry, we, we don't okay. know. And probably highly digested already. Now the uh, diaphragmatic is going to have a lot of fat associated with it too, so we need to be careful when you get down into there. The team worked carefully to avoid damaging the digestive system.
the intestinal loop. Yeah, yeah this is the duodenum. Yep. Here? Yep. And the stomach must be some, somewhere here. No, this is stomach here. Stomach. Now we're trying to get oriented here. <laughs> Samuel Martin wants to investigate whether his crocodile's premature death may have been caused by something it ate. And when it comes to solving mysterious animal deaths, Professor Alan Williams is the Sherlock Holmes of veterinary pathology. He's eager to remove this stomach and investigate its contents. Okay, um, so. Is it all on the same side? You all right? Okay, we're coming down your end, Alan. Veterinarian Mark yeah. Evans is also keen to examine so, the intestines. <laughs> He's never explored yeah, a reptile of this size before. This I mean, for me, the most impressive thing about this digestive system is for such a massive animal, how small it is. But essentially, what goes on in here, in terms of, of the, the breakdown, of huge chunks of animal into into tiny little pieces is just extraordinary. Yeah, yeah and, and think about the shapes of the things that are coming down here. These, these animals are, are swallowing, you know, limbs of ungulates. So, you know, so <laughs> big sections of bone. So you got hoof and a whole lot. Yeah, and, and I've, I've found uh, fishing lures, shotgun wads, coins, house cats, you name it, uh, in, in these animals. So this has to distend in, in all kinds of directions to you know allow them to to feed it all. I mean, these animals cannot use their, their teeth to orally process their food. They're just ripping off chunks and swallowing them fairly whole. Greg, if you could just hold the jar for us, please. We'll just try and lift this up. Right, these are the stomach well, contents. Mm. Wow. Mm. Okay, yeah, squeeze it, there might there. be some larger. Okay, here we go, I got something here. That's it. So Samuel, this is a very, very dark green colour. This with it's sorry. very strange, yeah. So this white material, if I just lift some of this out, what do you make of this? It's weird. What does it feel like? Cheese. Like cheese, yeah. Uh, the, the, the green colour it probably means that uh, maybe after the meal he might have eaten something he should not have. Maybe some, some leaf or something. Do you, see, do you see pica in crocodiles? So if they are unwell, they might have a deranged appetite and start eating things they wouldn't normally eat? Yeah, it, it does happen from time to time. They're also very curious, you know, and they come to any new thing and would, they might swallow it just by, by mistake. But mm. um, here it's, it's yeah. quite strange. I've, I've opened lots of alligator stomachs in the, mm -hmm. from the wild. I've never seen anything yeah, like this. This, this is completely foreign to me. So this is, this is very unusual. Crocodiles store excess fat as a food reserve in lumps like this inside their body. These fat pads are rapidly used up if the crocs unable to eat. And the fat pad, do you think that's a, a bit small? I, I would have expected uh, something about twice as big a mm -hmm. fat body twice as big as this one. It's like a reserve that can be used quite fast. But it, but it does suggest this is quite an acute problem on that base because this yeah. hasn't been exhausted, the other fat's still around. Yeah. So, I mean, if we've got a possibility here, this could be a toxic yeah. reaction. It, it could well be. Uh, is that a leaf? Ah, yeah. Leaf. We got a leaf. But and that looks almost like a wheel from a toy car. Yeah, yeah. Actually, so. Um, Heaven only knows what this this, uh, <laughs> this crocodile has been has been eating. It cannot be the reason. That could have been in, that could have been in there for years. Yeah, yeah. 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 This, this could be completely incidental. Of the bizarre contents of the stomach bring more questions than answers. The team must now venture deeper into the crocodile to search for clearer evidence of the cause of death. We choose our weapons. Great, thank you. Yeah, let's take the trachea down to about here, I guess. And then I think we should go ahead and do a midline cut. Yeah. The dissection team are hunting for signs of illness inside the crocodile. That's better. And they also want to examine more of its prehistoric parts. There you go. Oh, 
Okay, so this is the trachea, or the windpipe of the animal. This part goes forward towards the larynx, or voice box. And this part continues down toward the lungs. And here we have complete rings, which reinforce the trachea and keep it from collapsing as this animal is swallowing massive prey through this really large esophagus can, that can really stretch to, you know, to encompass very large bits of food because these animals can't process it down into little pieces with the teeth that they have, which are just grabbing teeth. They're not mashing teeth like you have in other animals. And so this esophagus is gonna really stretch out and take over this whole area, which means the trachea gets pushed off to the side, which is very unusual because in other animals, the trachea comes down the midline. This strong and flexible trachea is the vital link to the organs that enable the croc to hunt so stealthily, its lungs. To find out just how big a breath this croc can take, Greg wants to try to inflate the lungs with compressed air. Okie dokie. Perfect, Perfect fit. fit. Look at that. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> Should we give it a whirl? Go for it. All right. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. That is an impressive volume of air. That's a huge amount of air. Yeah, these animals can take in about four times the amount of air that we can. And, and this is, is essentially the scuba tank for these animals. So a big animal like this can stay underwater for as long as a half hour, which is a long time. Um, you know, the, the way they inspire or bring in this air is, uh, is using muscles on their ribs, and that expands the chest just like it does in us. But they also have another secret. They have the diaphragmatic muscles, which are right here, and these attach back onto the pubis. And when they pull backwards, they pull back on the liver and help expand the pleural cavities here so even more air can get sucked in. And uh, you know, it's, it's, like, a piston going yeah, it's like a piston, exactly. As seen in this X-ray footage, these unique muscles help crocodiles breathe. But biologist T.J. Uriona thinks they may also have a role underwater when breathing stopped. What we've got here is a little American alligator. Attached to his back is a little sensor that allows us to see whether or not the animal is pitching his head down or his tail down or rolling from side to side. We use that information to correlate muscle activity when the animal is uh, diving underwater. There we go, that's a dive right there. And uh, we can see the muscle activity. TJ's results show that the gator uses its diaphragm muscles underwater. The timing of this muscle activity exactly matches the movements the alligator makes in the water. It seems crocs and gators use these muscles to move their air-filled lungs inside their body and shift their center of buoyancy, enabling them to adjust their position in the water like a submarine. The crocodile sinking silently from the water's surface is an iconic image of a predator at work. It barely makes a ripple. It's a perfectly adapted hunter. The team's working carefully to uncover perhaps the most unusual part of the croc's anatomy. Its heart. This heart is uh, about the size of a human heart. A human heart is about the size of your fist, and that's about what we have here in terms of volume. Yeah, I think you might be looking at the right aortic arch there. Yeah, I just. That's nice. It out. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. This is all fat, huh? Yeah. Yeah. We, need, we need to it's just that to very it. delicately going down through there. The heart's ancient features may have evolved hundreds of millions of years ago, but its unique layout makes it ideally suited to this predator's way of life. There's a lot more tubes than you see in a human heart, so it's uh, a little bit tricky. The main aorta that carries blood from the heart to the body can be identified by its curved shape, known as the aortic arch. But bizarrely, unlike most animals, 
crocodiles have more than one. We're trying to find the other aortic arch. In humans, you have just a left aortic arch. In birds, you have a right aortic arch. And if you look at amphibians, you actually have both. So embryologically, you start out with both and you lose one or the other depending which way you go along that evolutionary tree. Crocodiles have kept the right aortic arch, like birds do. But interestingly, this animal, the crocodile, may also have some remnant of the left aortic arch. And so we're looking to trace that and see if we can find that here. Just as in humans, the croc has an artery to take blood from the heart to the lungs, and an aorta to take blood to the rest of the body. But the croc's mysterious extra aorta has puzzled biologists for decades. This aortic anomaly is the focus of research for Colleen Farmer. In her rooftop lab in Utah, she's had a breakthrough that might explain the need for this extra blood vessel. Her feisty subjects are a group of American alligators. She wants to see if there's a link between the extra aorta and how crocodilians are able to consume massive meals of meat and bone. I want to understand how fast they digest their food. Mm -hmm. And one way to do that is to actually image the bones that they swallow. So they don't chew their food, they just swallow big pieces whole. So uh, the bone will end up in the stomach of the animal intact. And then we're going to catch one of them and take it up to the x-ray machine to take our first measurement of the bone. This alligator's different from the others. Its extra aorta is blocked, and Colleen hopes to see if that affects its digestion. It's so cooperative. Oh. Every few days, she x-rays her gaiters to check how quickly they're digesting food. So what we see here are images of two different alligators. This image was taken 13 days after the animal ate its bone. And there's no evidence whatsoever of that bone in its stomach. In contrast, this alligator on the right-hand side has had the left aorta blocked. Um, it doesn't have the special conduit anymore. And it was taken 16 days after the animal had eaten the bone, and we see considerable pieces of the bone left. In gaiters with blocked aortas, Colleen finds digestion almost grinds to a halt. The extra aorta clearly plays a crucial role, and the secret may lie inside the heart. Blood that's traveled around the body is rich in carbon dioxide, a vital ingredient in the production of stomach acid. When needed, a tiny valve in the heart diverts this acidic blood to the stomach. This could be the key to the production of the extra stomach acid crocodiles generate to digest their massive prey. The team knows this crocodile wasn't digesting food properly, but they've yet to find out why, and they're running out of areas that might hold clues. Samuel had noticed his crocodile was behaving strangely back at the breeding center, lingering in the water longer than usual. Crocs and gators normally spend most of their day lying out in the sun, warming their cold-blooded bodies. They'll compete for the best basking sites and call to each other to mark territory or attract a mate. Joy wants to try to reproduce the sound a crocodile makes. If this animal were to exhale and send a lot of air through its throat, okay. we should get some sound from the yep. voice box, the larynx, which is located right in here. I might need you to lift the okay. mouth for me okay. so that we can get the air to come out. Okay, so let's let's see what happens. There. Yeah, let's see what happens. Oh yeah, this is, that, this is exactly it, yeah, yeah. 
Is it, it sound, sounds really like this, and when it comes from, from way through the lung, it's even more, more strong and more impressive. <laughs> That's it. Do they do it with the mouth right open or...? Oh yeah, very, very often the, the peak of, of roaring is during the mating season. Yeah, it goes uh, a lot showing how impressive I am and how, uh, how strong I can yell and telling other males, okay, I want to keep my, my, my piece of, uh, of water for me. This croc died during mating season a perilous time for a male. It could be a clue to the cause of its death. The dissection team wants to find out if this croc was sexually active before it died, but crocodiles keep their reproductive organs well hidden inside their bodies. The, the testes and, and, and the ovaries and the females are, are found in behind the, the guts when the animal's on its back. So they're, so they're, they're, they're kind of uh, dorsally positioned on these animals. And in, in this case, going along the, the epididymis here, um, where the sperm's stored, it's going to be conducted out to the penis here. Uh, and it's, it, it's, these, these fingers will sort of come together to help channel the sperm into the female. Sorry to interrupt, but so you, you know when you were blowing up the lungs, inflating the lungs, you said the right side was not inflating as much. If, if you look in there, we have a most horrible mess, and we've got really strong adhesions between the, the lung and the chest wall. So, so it had a respiratory it problem. It certainly has Absolutely. a respiratory problem. Okay. So we think the stuff, the digestive system problems that we saw, whatever that was, that green alien soup that came out of its stomach, probably secondary to the fact that it was very ill. Indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And that's and that's a vicious cycle, presumably. Once you once you become ill, yeah. you you can yeah. can't get then to your basking sites. Yeah. You can't get to food quicker, and it's just a downward spiral. Yeah, and it's probably why he did eat some leaves and some. Uh, vegetation material instead of, uh, of proper meat. So kind of out of desperation. Yeah. yeah. The team's starting to find clues that may solve this croc's mysterious death. While Alan Williams does more detailed pathology, the rest of the team wants to look inside a juvenile croc that also died in Samuels Park. It's been frozen and is being cut in half to reveal the intricate layout of its internal organs. Let's start at the head. If we clear some of the ice out of this area here, we're just showing you the oral cavity right over here. So this is all ice that was in the mouth. And now we can see the tongue. Here's the tongue. The structure right here is tongue. And right behind the tongue is the overlap of the larynx with the soft palate. Right over here, there's that palatal valve. If we follow down here, we also have an esophagus that runs parallel to the trachea. Right below it is the heart. And below the heart is the liver. If we follow the stomach, which is right over here, we go on. This area here is the intestines and eventually out through the cloaca. Overall, we see an animal that's really built for power. So much of its body is devoted to musculature for moving. Uh, both the legs and the neck and the tail. Only a small portion of it seems to really be devoted to the abdomen and thorax or the head region. But all the rest of this is very powerful. Perhaps the ultimate test of a croc's body is in a head-to-head -head battle with another croc. And in the competition for food, other predators are always a threat. This gladiator's defense lies in its skin. This is the skin from the bottom of the head under the jaw, continuing through the belly region all the way down to where the tail would begin. And we're looking at the belly surface of this animal, and you notice that it's a very light color. And this allows this animal to be countershaded, so prey that are below this crocodile looking up at it might not see it against the light color of the sky shining through the water. And you notice also that this belly surface is actually relatively smooth, even though it's armor plated. And that would allow this animal to easily slide along the mud flats if it's on the you know, bank of the river and it wants to slide back into the river. But if we look at the other side of the animal, the back is very dark. 
so a you know, wildebeest standing on the shore of, of, the, of the river might not see this crocodile swimming back up against the bank, because when you look down into the water, it looks dark. But the other thing is that it's not smooth anymore, like it is on the belly. It's actually got a lot of bumps on it that are raised up quite a bit in the back here as you get towards the tail. Kind of looks like the spines you always imagine on a dragon going down its back. And this makes for wonderful armor. So if, if this animal was in a fight with another big male crocodile, this would keep the animal protected. So it's a, it's a wonderful bit of armor plating. In fact, even the ancient Egyptians and the Romans used this as armor. They would actually dry off an alligator skin, prepare it, and wear it as armor. So if we look at this armor more closely, uh, we're actually going to try and understand the structure of it. Let's take a look at one of these scutes. So if we pull one off by dissecting it off here. It's actually quite hard to cut through the skin here. If this were easy to cut through, it wouldn't be very good armor, would it? We see a lot of thick skin here, a lot of connective tissue. Let's take a look at what's inside one of these. We have a whole bunch of bones here that have been cleaned off, so you don't see the skin anymore. And they actually overlap one over the next, just like this. Leaving them overlap like that allows no chinks in the armor. So these animals are quite well protected when these armor plates are overlapping. The croc's bony skin is an excellent shield. But in order for this cold-blooded animal to survive, it needs to absorb heat through this thick skin. It achieves this through a remarkable mechanism deep within the armor. Joy wants to investigate one of the bony plates to find out how they keep the croc warm. Let's take a look at one of these that's been cut so we can see the inside of it. You can see very, very fine little channels running up and down here. These fine little channels are actually for blood vessels that are running up and down through the plate all the way to the surface. And then those blood vessels are going to run underneath the skin so this animal is going to be able to absorb a lot of energy from the sun, which is going to heat up those, the blood vessels and then be able to carry the heat back into the animal, kind of like a big solar panel. So that is going to allow a lot of heat exchange to occur all along the back of the animal. From its bone-crushing bite to its armor-plated solar panels, the teams demonstrated the effectiveness of the croc's prehistoric adaptations. But the crocodile has something else that may hold the key to its survival. At the University of California, Irvine, physiologist James Hicks is studying how warm-blooded and cold-blooded animals react to changes in temperature. Well, what we did was we just brought in an alligator and a rabbit from a warm room and brought them into a room here that's at 15 degrees centigrade. And what we're doing here is looking at the amount of heat that is radiating from these animals as they have been brought into a cooler room. The difference between a, a warm-blooded animal and the cold-blooded animal is not the actual body temperature, but the fact that the warm-blooded animal, like the rabbit, generates its body temperature from having a high metabolism. And the reptile, has a body temperature that's a result of an outside heat source like the sun. So we notice that snakes and lizards and alligators and turtles spend time basking in the sun. Now, if we look at John, our graduate student here, show us your arm, John. You can see John is quite red. We look up at his face, very red. He's radiating heat off because he's an endotherm, a warm-blooded animal. He's generating a lot of metabolic heat, and it's just radiating off his body. The rabbit looks blue, but it's not because it's cold-blooded. It's because the fur is retaining the heat inside its body, and the surface of the fur is very cold, as it is in the room here. If we look over at our alligator that we brought in, you can see the tips of the feet are starting to become blue. And eventually, over time, this animal will become, the alligator will become the same temperature as the room. Ectothermia or cold bloodedness is a, is a very interesting survival strategy because you do not require as much energy per day. When the environment becomes fairly patchy, if there is a reduction in the amount of resources available, if prey disappear or move off to some different location, cold blooded animals can just hunker down and survive because they're just not requiring much energy every day. Whereas a warm blooded animal would have to continue eating. So this is just an alternative strategy. Uh, to be cold-blooded, and it's a very uh, successful one, as these animals have been around for 250 million, 300 million years.
Being cold-blooded offers an important survival advantage. Scientists investigating these cave-dwelling crocs in Madagascar were amazed to find them surviving in such cool conditions. These animals could be living proof that because crocodiles are cold-blooded, they can slow down their body's metabolism and survive harsh times on a bare minimum of food and warmth. As tough as these animals are, something unusual happened to this crocodile for it to die young. The team has finished their examination of the entire crocodile and pathologist Alan Williams can now deliver his final verdict on the cause of death. If you remember, what we found in the stomach was a lot of this sort of soapy-like material and it's got a single small stone which crocodiles are known to swallow to aid the digestion process. But apart from this and a bit of mucus, the stomach is, is empty, as indeed was the whole of the rest of the digestive system, which suggests to me that this crocodile hadn't been eating for quite some time. Uh, the big problem with, that this crocodile had, though, was in its lungs. And if you remember, when we were inflating the lungs, one of them didn't inflate particularly well. Well, there are also lots of abscesses present in this lung as well. So one here, for example, some smaller ones here, another one just here. And if we just cut into this larger abscess, it's very firm material, suggesting it's been there for some time. And we've got this lovely abscess with a thick capsule around it. That has taken weeks or longer to develop, probably enough to stop the crocodile eating. And this infection has now spread around the body. And the crocodile has been unable to cope with this particularly well uh, because if you look in this little jar here, the liver is floating and they shouldn't do that. And what it's suggesting to me is that there's a lot of fat in, this, in the liver. So do you remember those fat pads that were smaller than we'd yeah, anticipated? The fat body, the fat body was, is much smaller, isn't it? Yeah. Than so I think the crocodile hasn't been eating because it's been unwell. The animal has been mobilising its fat reserves sending it to the liver to be processed, and it's basically done it so quickly then the liver gets overloaded and the cells swell up with all this fat and the cells stop working. So you're really into this vicious cycle and that's what drags the animal down at the end of the day. The crocodile died of a severe lung infection and the complications that followed. But the loss of this extraordinary animal provided the team the rare opportunity to explore ancient anatomy dating back to the time of the dinosaurs. When one says that crocodiles have been around for a very long time, what one means is they haven't changed very much for a very long time. Presumably, what it means is that they've found a very satisfactory way of life and there's no particular reason to change it. From the outside, crocodiles may look prehistoric, but this animal autopsy has shown they're anything but primitive. Their bodies are brilliantly adapted to the way they live, and surely that's why they've survived, unchanged, for so long.